Welcome to Moments with Mary Ann. This is your host, Mary Ann Pastana. We're here today with special guest, Joan Mellon, who's here to share with us her new memoir, Sherlock Being Catfished. So do you think you could recognize the signs of an online scam before it's too late? Well, you'd be amazed how many people fall for scams on a yearly basis. Joan Mellon was nicknamed Sherlock by New Orleans police detective because she tackled the ill-fated JFK assassination trial undertaken by New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison in a book called A Farewell to Justice and turned it into her own investigation. Author Joan Mellon is an award Temple University professor emeritus, now retired, has written 25 books and numerous articles about international controversies like those involving Cuba, Israel, and the CIA, as well as film histories and biographies of Marilyn Monroe, playwriter Lillian Hellman, and many more. So welcome to the show, Joan Mellon. Thank you. I should tell you the Sherlock part is that I have already, this is my 25th book. They're all on Amazon. So you can see that I am an investigator and I should be smarter than to fall for someone like this, which is from, which is from Facebook and from the internet. And the thing is that I had, I, I never would have fallen for it. But what happened was that I was teaching for many, many years and I retired. I was, teaching, I, I was teaching for 50 years at Temple University in the creative writing program. And then it was over because I was tired. It was too much. I didn't want to do it anymore. The students weren't as cooperative as they used to be. They didn't want to read. They didn't want to think, whatever. Think, this, 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 this system just changed. And so I was happy to retire 50 years. That's long. And so then I was at loose ends. So I look at my computer and I look at Facebook. And I find that many people have written to me that I never ignored. I never paid any attention to any of it. Any of it. And the reason is they want, they had questions. I was writing one of my main topics in my research was the Kennedy assassination and the recent Garrison investigation in New Orleans. So they had questions that they didn't feel were answered by my books. So I didn't mind. I thought that's fine. I I don't mind answering now because I'm not teaching anymore. I have time. And so unbeknownst to me. There was an email that really had nothing to do, wasn't interested in the Kennedy assassination. I'm not sure he ever even heard of the Kennedy assassination. I just thought it was another fan. And, you know, people are so egotistic and they they like fans and they like people to write them letters and what, what a great researcher you are and what great information you have in your book, a fair, what was called A Farewell to Justice. And I, I thought I had kind of solved the Kennedy assassination. Wow. And so all these letters, all these emails, all these people wanting to be on their films and podcasts and documentaries. And so that's how it happened. He got into my life on my computer by me answering. They can't get in unless you answer them. And I didn't even know what or how awful Facebook was. Oh, Facebook, that's nothing bad, is it? Well, what it is is a host, it's a place to hide out for scammers and for people that are going to cheat you and are people going to make plans in order to steal money from you. What do I know? So I'm flattered. And, I, and then they said, what did you do this weekend? And it got to, then he started calling me sunshine and sweetheart. And I wasn't with anyone at that time. And so I thought, oh, isn't that really nice sunshine? No one had ever called me sunshine before and so forth. And then he started writing me more often, maybe several times a day. Then I started looking forward to these emails. And pretty soon, we have a relationship, or we think we have a relationship. We don't really have one. And at one point, at one point he sent a photograph, an email, of a big bunch of roses, long stem roses. And I think, oh, how nice. When I wonder when they'll come. Then I'm reminding myself that he doesn't know my address. He doesn't know where I am. How is he going to send me flowers? By that time, we moved on to another topic. So that partic- that photograph of red roses is in my book, Sherlock Being Catfished, which I think is sort of serves me right. And I think I'm getting roses when I'm not. And nothing. Real- and then and then it, it increased more emails, more interested in me. 
every suddenly everything I did was of interest to him. What doctor? Did, I might say I went to the doctor. Well, what was it? Was which kind of doctor was it? And he just kept. He's so interested. What did you do today? What did you eat today? Where did you go? And I just fell for it and answered. And I don't know what else to say. If I want to, don't. If it, he never called me once, not once on the telephone. So I would say one of my first things to offer people if they're looking for um, a way to avoid this cautionary tale. And in the cautionary tale, it should be if the person doesn't telephone you at all, be suspicious of the gender because it means they're trying to hide. Maybe it's not a man, maybe it's a woman. And especially, I'm an English teacher, so I should know that the the language is not good. First of all, the grammar is not right. Then uh, it doesn't doesn't make sense. And I just think, oh, so what if he doesn't speak? Do I really need somebody that speaks perfect English? Yes, I think I do. And then I started trying to see if there were discrepancies. In in between, there was a little voice in my head that started to ask myself questions about whether he, he didn't know who the New York Mets were. I mentioned the Mets. I went to a Mets game. He didn't know who. The, now, if you don't know who the Mets are, chances are you're not in the United States. I think everyone knows who the Mets are, even people in California, right? Even anywhere. The Mets are known to all. He didn't know who that was. He didn't know who Gabriel Garcia Marquez was, a famous novelist, a Nobel Prize winning novelist, because he wrote this great love story called Love in the Time of Cholera. So I was trying to tell the plot to this guy. Who, my, who called himself Michael Devlin, although he never no once said that he was Irish. Now, that name is as Irish as could be. So that in itself was already a, another clue that, that we had. So he didn't know Garcia Marquez. He didn't know the Mets. Now I have, I wrote a book about college basketball. And the main figure in that book was a basketball coach called Bob Knight, pretty much known to everyone because he once threw a chair on the court, very well known. He didn't know who Bob Knight was. So in my book, I, the publisher was very kind. He put color photographs. So we have a color photograph of me with Garcia Marquez. We have a color photo of me with Bob Knight and so forth. And, and also some of my students I put in. One of my colleagues, his name was Chip Delaney. I put him in. And we, I kind of had fun with that. It was very nice to see all those pictures. But I was the dupe, wasn't I? I was the fool. I needed somebody and I admitted it. I admitted that I really wanted to meet somebody and know somebody and have a relationship. And then I kept thinking in my own mind, I really did. When am I going to meet him? And I said, are you going to, when are you going to come, come to visit me? Oh no. He said, I'm going to, you're going to come to visit me. And then I said, I have a swimming pool. You should never, never tell him anything about yourself. And then he said, I have a pool. And then when he sent pictures in his, of his place in Arizona, he's from supposedly in Arizona, there was not a single cactus. And I sometimes watch a sports program on ESPN called Pardon the Interruption. And one of the hosts of that show, but he lives in Arizona. And, and he always big cactus are in the picture, but not in the pictures. Then he said he had a dog. And he said, this dog is named Reagan. And I never said anything political to him. Something stopped me. I don't know, because I guess we would never agree. But I mean, the dog was called Reagan. And uh, I said, at one point I said, oh, the dog has the same expression on its face as you do. Oh, thank you. And he really enjoyed that. And he, every, anything that I said, he wanted to make me feel happy and comfortable. Then he said, what do you, what do you think we're going to be doing in five years and in 10 years? That's a cliche from the Hallmark television. When a couple meet and they ask that question, I said something dumb. Like we're going to be in a little cottage by the sea, ignoring global warming, ignoring you don't go to the sea anymore to live and so forth. Everything I did was out of touch, out of reality. And I don't know. I mean, I at the end of it, he realized when I didn't send the money, that was all over. And I told him I was not going to send the money. I still wanted to see him. I still hoped he'd call. I even had a dream that he called me. But of course, it was he didn't. There was no phone call. And there was no, it was just a real dream, a dream that he'd, he'd, he'd appear. And I wrote a few emails and he never replied to them. If he shows suspicion, that's good. Because then they just realize it's not worth their while. They're not going to get anywhere with you. 
you're not the right victim for them. I hope that people read this book. It's a very short book. It's only about a little over 100 pages, and there's a paperback and a hardback. And I think that people might enjoy it and laugh. I think it's humorous, and uh, I'm happy because I didn't lose money, and I couldn't afford to lose money. I don't know what I was thinking. Well, you were thinking what I think a lot of people think is that, hey, this is a chance at being in a relationship. And how many people feel that way? I mean, we've got an an epidemic of loneliness going on right now. Well, on that note, we're going to pause here for a quick break. We've been speaking with Joan Mellon in regards to her new memoir, Sherlock Being Catfished. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. We'll be right back after these messages from our sponsors. Are you an author, speaker, or expert who is looking for more publicity? Visit RadioGuestList.com and sign up for free interview requests from shows looking for guests. Radio Guest List is the number one free booking resource for radio, podcasts, and TV talk shows who are looking for experts like you right now. Visit RadioGuestList.com and sign up today to get the visibility you deserve. There comes a moment when you realize you're somewhere special. When you discover that each beautiful creature that you see has been rescued from a life of absolute horror and brought to this incredibly free place, here is where their lives were forever changed and where yours will as well. Discover over 500 tigers, bears, and lions at the brand new visitor center at the Wild Animal Sanctuary just outside Denver. For more information, visit wildanimalsanctuary.org. Discover true freedom at the Wild Animal Sanctuary. It's one thing to become attached to your perfect home, but what do you do when that home becomes attached to you? A family in dire need of a fresh start, a mysterious house tied to the past. Buried deep within the foundation of the old Far Hill Manor lies a centuries-old secret. Dark forces or something stronger just waiting to be discovered. Caretaker, a supernatural thriller by breakout author R.J. Halpert. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. I'd like to thank Jason Eastwood at Guitarfulness for sharing his inspiring music and talent with us. His music is known worldwide for cultivating atmospheres of harmony, inner peace, and clarity. Visit Jason's website at guitarfulness.com. Join his newsletter, be part of his community, and download his music. Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. We're here today with special guest, Joan Mellon, who's here sharing with us her new memoir, Sherlock Being Catfished. And one of the things that you talked about, I'd like to unpack a little bit. You talk about being called Sherlock. Where did you get that name? Good question. An enjoyable question for me. When I was doing my research into the Garrison investigation in Louisiana, there was a police officer who had been assigned to the United States government to do the House Select Committee investigation on the New Orleans side of the Kennedy assassination. And his name was Robert Buras. I managed to get his phone number, Miracle of Miracles, but I'm not too bad at that. And I would ask him questions because he was a police officer who had been with the New Orleans police and also with police intelligence for years. So I would, and he, and he investigated the Kennedy. So I asked him questions. And eventually he'd answer, and he would always head his emails back to me, Dear Sherlock. And it was it was ironic. He was very smart. It was ironic because, of course, he was the Sherlock. He was the real investigator, and I was just an amateur beginner. But I I didn't care, and and it was fun. And I love to learn. I'm a teacher. Don't forget. So I really love to learn, and learned so much from him. Eventually, bad things happened, such as Hurricane Katrina. And I had visited New Orleans at the time, and his house was filled with mold, black mold. And I saw it in person. I saw all that. 
And so it wasn't so much fun. Meanwhile, he kept calling me Dear Sherlock and a little, you know, a little acerb- acerbic. So that's how that came about. I, I just was proud of it. I thought, well, if he's calling me Sherlock, I can't be that bad an investigator. Maybe I figured out a few things about the Garrison investigation and the Kennedy assassination, how that was. I was very proud of that. I can see why. And I'm sure you did bring a lot of questions to light and uncover things that he probably wasn't going to think about. It, you always need a new perspective. Well, yeah, but uh, I, uh, I I learned a lot and it's all in my book. The book is called A Farewell to Justice. So, you, And it's a title that actually Garrison himself planned to use for his memoir, but didn't. And so I stole it. And I and I even mentioned in the book that that's how I got that title. And Buris was, uh, you know, was 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 sort of taciturn. Didn't talk that much. Didn't fawn over Garrison. He was very um, he was very religious. Also, I'm not. We we, we had nothing really in common except investigating. I enjoyed his investigations of the same characters that I had to look into as well in upper in Louisiana north uh, north of Baton Rouge. In, in towns of Clinton and Jackson. So I was, uh, it was a great time for me. It was me at my best. Me at my worst is this. And uh, not, but to top it all off, I have to say, at one point, after it was all over and these people were gone, I went on Google, Googled his name, and I also Googled logger, L O G G E R, like he was a logger. And up came an article in the Atlantic Monthly by a real life logger named um, Chuck Colson. And not only that, but there was an article about Chuck Colson in which he's quoted, and the very quote of, of Chuck Colson talking about logging appears in one of the emails that Devlin sent to me. So he was a plagiarist. He oh, stole wow. life stirring of Colson, and uh, he, that's how he figured out how to present himself as a logger. Who knew loggers? And I mentioned in my book, I, I wrote some books about Japanese movies, that the only thing, the only logger I ever knew was in Kurosawa's movie Rashomon, where a logger goes along and, fi- and, and comes upon the story of the and murder and that, at the heart of the film. And so I thought that was very, and, and the logger is, is a good person. And at the end of the film, he comes to a temple. He's in the courtyard and he sees a crying baby and the baby is uh, abandoned. Obviously, somebody left this baby in the, at the temple. And the, the woodcutter is about to pick it up and take, and and the priest who's in the in there stops him, and he thinks that the man is going to steal the baby's clothes, and they're very fancy clothes, indicating that there was a rich man, that family that left the baby in the courtyard. And the logger has to explain to the priest that he was only going to take him home because he had six children of his own, and one more wouldn't make a difference, and he wanted to, he wanted to take in this baby, and the priest then who's, of course, of a different class than the logger, says uh, he, he apologizes. Class relations are, are, are reversed. And that is because the logger only uh, did not want to steal the clothes or sell the clothes or any of that, but he just wanted to open his heart. He, one more child wouldn't matter to him. And so I, that's a wonderful ending for that. And the movie is not about this issue of three people or four people looking at a story and telling it in to telling different versions of the story, who killed whom and all of that, but rather uh, something else. The American audiences in Rashomon think it's about different versions of the same story, but it's not about that. And so I I enjoyed writing. I've written books about Japanese movies and I enjoy writing about them. There's something about Japanese movies, classic Japanese movies, not cartoons or anything like that, that really make me happy. So I was able to incorporate into this Catfish book Many things that I've done in my life, like Met going to the Mets game, go teaching, fighting with Roger Stone, which is in there's a story about Roger Stone threatening me, which is scary, and things that happened along the way, books that I've written, interviewing Garcia Marquez in Mexico City. That was big, and I have that photograph there in case anyone doubts that it really happened. So I'm in, I was able to incorporate my life, what I tried to do, what I was interested in doing, with this modern moment when I was catfished. You have had such a remarkable life. My goodness, all the things that you've done. And it it has me kind of thinking, I mean, as this, you know, you're going through this, you know, being catfished, which so many people across the United States are going through and even the world are going through. And 
it's just heartbreaking to see that type of thing happen. I understand it was your researcher assistant that helped you. Audrey, she's here yeah. right there in the other room. And uh, she uh, she blocked him. She saw what was happening. She understood immediately what catfishing was. She'd read about it. She'd seen the TV show on M- MTV. And she just knows how to use the computer better than me. So she grabbed my computer and blocked him. Or So he couldn't, he couldn't write as beg he couldn't start in about go get to the bank and get the money and all of that and we came away with our money and uh so no she's fabulous she's a, just a wonderful person and she was my creative writing student because i taught creative writing at temple university the students were all their thesis was going to be their first book so i was always anxious well i hope they i want them to publish i want them to become writers and not everybody did and not everybody wanted to but that was what we were doing so Audrey and I have some better relationship, and that is working on um, things that happen in my life here, my writing life, in my work life, and in, in, in books that I write. I've been very lucky there, very lucky. Well, it seems that your your memoir dives into the psychology behind why people, even very highly accomplished individuals, and it happens all the time, can fall victim to romance scams. So what are some of the key insights that you think well, I have to say that it's for me, and this is not everybody. But when I went to look, why did I? Why did this happen to me? And then I look at the end of the book. I, de- I describe my childhood, and I never thought that my childhood and the miseries of that, and the abuse, and the bad things that happened, I never thought that had anything to do with this. So long ago, and and then it turns out that it did. So you, t- the reader, should judge for themselves whether they it's convincing. But I wrote the last two ch- two pages, just the last two pages, are about wh- why this would happen to me, why it's likely to happen, why I wanted to give him the money so badly, why I wanted to hurt myself, because that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to punish myself for things that happened in my life long, long ago. I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't gone through this. So I did. and I And then it was over. What lessons do you think that you have taken from this that you're walking with today? Don't go on Facebook. Don't go on the internet. Don't look, don't go, don't let people into your life whom you don't know very, very, let them go very, very, very slowly. And also ask questions of people. What, what do you want? Why are you interested in me? What do you want from me? What do you want to talk about with me? Why don't you know who the Mets are? (laughs) Why, if they, if they, if there are some clues like that, you don't know what the Kennedy assassination was about. Maybe you're not an American. Maybe you're from Romania. So when the people came here and looked at did that re- reverse search on Google, and they see that this, he sent me a picture at one point, and he's on a, wood, a, a machine that cuts logs, and we real and they they trace the fit the, the origin of that machine. These people can they were filmmakers; they know how to do that. And it turned out that they were that the machine itself was made in Romania. Now that seems to be more connected to Cuba in a way. But I mean, I tried to do the Cuban investigation too, and I have fr- I wrote a book about Cuba, of all things. I have pr- friends from Cuba, and I asked them, "Are there palm trees?" Because the people who were here from Haiti said, "Well, I mean, are there, look at all these palm trees. There are no palm trees like that in Cuba, pine fire forests." So I found these two old friends of mine. One is a novelist called Christina Garcia, and another is a realtor in Key Biscayne, Eduardo Sanchez Rionda. They're from a very, very prom- prominent family in Cuba. Of course, this is all before the Cuban Revolution. And I asked them if there were palm trees in Cuba. Are there pine forests? And both Eduardo and Christina both said yes. There were pine. Who knew? I never. I wrote a book about Cuba, but I'd never been to Cuba, so I didn't know there were pine forests in Cuba. So I learned that. I learned don't assume that you know something when you don't. Don't assume anything in life. When I was once writing a book about Bob Knight, the basketball coach, and I was at one of his practices, and he told his students, when you're thinking about what what play you're going to do or whatever, never assume because you're going to be wrong. So then all these experiences force you back to reality. I believe in truth. I believe that there is such a thing as truth. And all these people that don't, I I, I just, um, they're up to no good. And I think don't become friends with anybody in, in Facebook unless you have a mutual acquaintance of some kind. Well, it's always very good to be cautious. And anytime anyone asks you for money, that's a big red flag to run the other way. You know? And I, and I try to list in the book 
as many red flags as I, I mean, there were many red flags, such all the things that he didn't know about, all his, the way he spoke English. Then at one point we were asking each other, what food do you like? And he said he grew up in Louisiana and he didn't know what fish etouffee. If you grew up in Alexandria or wherever, in, where he said he was, I can't recall where he said he was from in Louisiana, you would have known that. You would have known what crawfish etouffee was. All the red flags to look for. Well, Joan, where can our listeners connect with you and be part of your community and learn not just about Sherlock being catfish, but all of your other great books? Well, you can get the books, of course, on my website uh, or on Amazon.com. The website is joanmellon.com, but really Amazon is a good place to buy a book. Well, Joan, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you, Marianne. I enjoyed it a lot. I enjoyed it very much. Well, thank you, Joan. It's been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new memoir, Sherlock Being Catfished. Sherlock Being Catfished is available to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and everywhere books are sold. And remember, support our indie bookstores. If you don't see it on the shelf, just ask for them to order it. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.